once again thanks to organizer thank you dr benival uh, he is my senior and uh, thanks to extra danika for choosing me as a speaker uh, the topic of the talk is new age management of prostate cancer a focus on prap inhibitor so as uh, we all know it is the incidence wise uh, prostate cancer is 12th in the row and uh, overall prognosis of the metastatic crpc is poor and it is 1 to 3 years bracket so we want to improve upon this and uh, nowadays uh, everyone is seeing like uh, it is increasing uh, in the uh, in the younger age group so since 1990 to 2017 it has increased to two fold uh, in the annual percentage in the global incidence of the all men between the 15 to 39 years of the age we don't know what is the basis of that it may be the genetically driven tumor or we might picking up the tumor early this is the uh, uh, seen worldwide because some of the countries in the world they still running the psa screening program so this slide has shown in the uh, uh, talk of the dr nikhil gadial patil and uh, this is a metastatic crpc we are more concentrated over this so this is the uh, slide which dr benival has recently talked about it is a heterogeneous disease metastatic ca prostate is a heterogeneous disease genetically why because various mutation has been found in the various pathways and we want to target these pathways though we have only uh, available target for this dna repair pathway but we know like it is wind pathways at fault in 18% of the cases pi3k pathways in 49% of the cases 71% patient has ar pathway defects various defects sometimes the cell cycle defects are there sometimes they are combined so overall 90% patient had have some or uh, some or other defect in the uh, dna uh, gene genetic level so we are concentrating more over this 23% of mutation were identified in the dna repair pathway because we have drug to target this pathway so what are these defects mutation in the dna repair pathway can lead to genetic instability and derives a tumor growth so if there is a single stranded break it can be repaired by the base excision and it is the prap enzyme which repair this defect particularly single strand defect if patient, if uh, uh, the tumor has a bulky adducts between the two uh, between the strands of the dna we need a nucleotide excision repair pathway intact if this is a base mismatch like it is adenosine and it should be uh, complementary with the thionine and it instead of that it is guanine this is a base mismatch which is known as the mss2 and mlh1 mismatch repair defect we have the another drug known as the immunotherapy but we are more concentrating over the double stranded dna defect uh, tumor cells have the defect in the this repair pathway the normal in the normal every human cell have this atm braca1 braca2 plb2 chek2 and red 51 genes to repair this kind of the double stranded dna break but in uh, we have uh, seen in the la previous slide almost 23% of the patient have this mutation in the this uh, repair uh, genes so if the mutation has happened into this repair gene the cell will not survive and the cell will automatically die so we have no problem with that but what happens is patient the tumor cell has the prap enzyme which will which will repair this single stranded break but this will be leave behind so this single stranded repaired uh, dna will cause the tumor cell growth it convert into the oncogenic oncogenic pathway and tumor will grow so it is known as synthetic lethality so better not to have this uh, uh, mutation uh, in the, the dna repair gene aberration are enriched in the patient with the loco regional or biochemically recurrent or metastatic prostate cancer so that means the disease if the disease has advancement in the uh, spectrum they have the more defects so localized disease or early stage disease they have less defect or maybe the germline effect only but in the advanced stage almost uh, 8.6% per, patient had braca2 germline mutation braca2 somatic mutation is 7.7% almost 16% uh, of patient have this braca1 or 2 mutation and other mutations are also there atm chek2 and uh, this red red 51 genes so if you see the nccn guidelines where it uh, where this is, uh, test stands for so if patients you will consider here regional or metastatic disease where the germline testing is recommended germline testing is recommended in all subgroup because we know like we need to counsel the patients patients relative also but in the uh, this one 
metastatic setting with the recommendation of NCCN is we need to do the molecular and biomarker testing in this particular subgroup regional and advanced metastatic disease where we need to consider uh, testing of HRR gene and MSI MMR. So these two testing we need to do and nowadays we have also changed our practice. Now we do this test. That means we need to counsel the patient for germline mutation each and every patient but the patient just has the regional or local regional or metastatic disease we need to counsel for this HRR gene testing and MSI MMR testing. So this is the uh, background and rationale for using PRAP inhibition in metastatic CRPC. So despite significant progress in the systemic therapy, metastatic MCRPC continues to be lethal and the overall survival is one to three years. And in our patient, it is around one to two years. MCRPC is molecularly heterogeneous. Up to 30% of the patient harbor the deleterious alteration of the DNA damage repair pathway, including those direct or indirect role in the HRR gene repair pathway. So this gene pathway can be targeted by the PRAP inhibition and of that, BRCA1 and BRCA2 and ATM are the most well characterized and BRCA2 is the most common. So this is the trial design of the profound trial where the Olaparib was tested. Uh, profound trial is the first randomized phase 3 study evaluating the efficacy and safety of the Olaparib versus new hormonal agent in patient with the HRR mutated MCRPC. So they uh, they have the, the uh, inclusion criteria was documented evidence of the metastatic CRPC and they should be qualified for the HRR mutation present in the tumor tissue. So all the patient had the, uh, this mutation in the homologous recombination repair pathway and then there should be failure of the one NHA, this newer hormone agent, maybe abiraton or angiotamide. they should fail upon that and then they, be, they will be included in this trial and PS, PS score is 0 to 1. So they were divided into two cohort. One cohort, cohort A was uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutated patient and ATM was taken up into the cohort A. And cohort B was other uh, other mutation, maybe check 2 and uh, uh, this uh, red 51 or other mutations. So the 2 is to 1 randomization was done. It was an open label trial. So Olapari was given 300 mg BD uh, and physician choice of the drug. The physician choice was limited to the newer hormone therapy. Suppose patient had uh, failed on the angiolutamide, then it was given abiratron. If patient was failed on the abiratron, then they were given angiolutamide or other aplutamide type of the drug. Cohort B, the same schema was applied. So uh, there was a uh, cross, there was crossover was allowed. Op optional, uh, Olapari was optional in the, if the patient has a progress on the physician choice treatment, both the arm health allowed the crossover. So primary endpoint was the radiological progression free survival in the cohort A and the second endpoints were uh, overall response rate in the cohort A, radiological progression by BICR in the cohort A plus B. That means the old comers, they need to check the radiological progression free survival, time to pain progression only in the cohort A, overall survival in the cohort A and the hepatitis and tolerability of the drug. So these were the 15 gene panel mutations they have tested by the foundation one test. BRCA1 and BRCA2 ATM, they have included in the cohort A and other old gene mutations. If any was there, they were included in the cohort B. So this is the site very well made trial, which is the specialty of the international trial. Median age was the 68 years, 67, 69, 69. So almost the same. And uh, you can see the metastasis, they have taken bone only, visceral and other mats. And patient... Uh, BRCA1, BRCA2 and ATM mutation, you can see like 49% of the patient in the cohort A was BRCA2 mutated and 37% patient in the ATM mutated patient in the cohort A. So this is the, again, the demographic profile of that. We will skip that. So this is the uh, trial result. So Olaparib or Limparja significantly improved RPFS, radiological progression piece survival by BICR in the patient with alteration in the BRCA1 and BRCA2 or ATM in cohort A. You can see the progression free survival was 7.39 months in the Olaparib arm versus 3.55 in the physician choice arm and hazard ratio was quite significant. It was 0.34. So almost 76% of the patient had reduction in the progression. You are moving the slide. Okay. I am not moving. And uh, in the, this forest plot, 
each and each subgroup had benefit with the olaparib arm olaparib this cohort a arm yeah, whether the patient ever used to texan or no previous texan metastasis disease visceral measurable disease or not any ps they have uh, benefit with the olaparib arm and this is the uh, this is the graph showing if patient had measurable disease the uh, you can say objective response was 21 fold increased in the olaparib arm as compared to the physician choice arm and this is uh, oral survival curve you can see the overall survival in cohort a was 18.5 months with the olaparib arm versus physician choice arm it was 15.1 month and hazard ratio is 0.64 which is significant and p value was also significant uh, this is cohort A and B. Cohort A and B is what? What is the? This is the old comers. Uh, intent to treat analysis. Still, it is important. RPFS uh, was better in the olaparib arm. It was 5.82 month versus 3.52 month, and HR ratio was significant 0.49. So, patient has any uh, mutation in the HRR pathway, we can target with the olaparib. This is the message by this slide, and uh, this A and B. This is the all patient who had the HRR mutation, Olaparib has uh, proven to be better in all subgroups. And this is the uh, response rate. So obviously, uh, this cohort A had a better subgroup like BRCA1, BRCA2, and ATM. So there the odds ratio was 21. Here the odds ratio was 6. That means a six-fold increase in the response rate if you use Olaparib in the HRR pathway mutation, mutated patient. So despite the crossover was allowed, the uh, OS was better in the olaparib arm. It was 17.5 months versus 14.26 months and HR ratio was significant. And this is the physician's choice treatment versus olaparib in the median time to progression for the pain. So this is very important thing because clinicians are always worried about the patient's symptomatology. So it is proven to be better like olaparib arm Pain, pain progression, time to pain progression was not achieved versus nine months in the physician choice arm and HR ratio was 0.44. That is very significant thing. And that's what we wanted to achieve. And this I will skip. And this is the uh, amount of the effect of the olaparib in the BRCA mutation other than BRCA and BRCA. So the most uh, important effect was achieved in the BRCA2 mutated patient, then CDK4, CDK12, ATM, and here rate 51B genes. And the other uh, endpoints, RPFS benefit was greater for Olaparib uh, versus fusion choice, NHA in cohort A and cohort A plus B. This is all comers and here is the cohort A. So you can see a patient, uh, patient had received prior texan yes or no there is no difference in the median rpfs it was same 7.4 month and here cohort a and b means they were diluted with the other gene mutation so it was 5.8 months as compared to the other arm which is very low and this is the os benefit you can see arm a was 17.3 month if the prior texans were used if prior texans were not used then it was 20.7 month as compared to this arm and here the old comers where the olaparib has uh, given the worst benefit of 15.8 month as compared to the physician, physician choice where it was 11.4 month only. Uh, this is the uh, slide shown the side effect profile. We will see later on the other sides as well there. So you see, uh, we know like olaparib we, we are using in ovarian cancer also in prostate cancer. So the common side effects are anemia, nausea, fatigue and asthenia. These are common as compared to the physician choice. But amount, grade may be different, but amount is almost almost equal. Anemia is more in the uh, olaparib arm. Fatigue and asthenia is just double with the, as the physician choice arm. But they are very well manageable side effect. The most common adverse event were anemia, nausea and fatigue. 4.3% patient on olaparib experienced pulmonary embolism versus 0.8%. But they all were the lower grade and were managed and resolved uh, as the cut point analysis and there were no re uh, no uh, reports of the mds and aml but we we know like in the in the ovarian cancer trial they have the mds and aml cases also at the eight year follow up so uh, this is pulmonary embolism this is a uh, uh, adverse event of special interest of for olaparib but generally cons consistent with non safety profile. We know hematological toxicities are there, anemia, thrombocytopenia, and uh, leukopenia. 
Myelodysplastic syndrome in this trial, particularly it was there were no case reported, but we know like if the long term follow up is there, it is less than one point five percent. And pneumonitis, uh, we we have one patient and they have also reported, uh, but fatal outcome has been reported in less than one percent of the patient. So we'll skip this slide. Uh, this I will. Uh, so how uh, we will go about the uh, testing of the patient? Uh, we can test the uh, archival tissue. We can we can use the CT DNA or we can have the fresh biopsy. But somatic testing is also very important because if you don't do the somatic testing, uh, we, you will lose the fifty percent of the patient. And if you have validated lab, you should do the CT DNA testing also. So preferred algorithm initial tissue testing allowed by germline mutation testing. If insufficient sample or no tissue uh, in the absence of validated CT DNA testing. So this, uh, the practice is you need to ask for the patient to do first the biopsy of the metastatic disease. If it is possible, you should do that, which will turn out to be somatic uh, gene testing. If not, then you do the CT DNA testing. And if it is not available, we should do the archival tissue. Archival tissue is the least yield. So we should not rely on that uh, and try to motivate the patient. And this is the NCCN guideline where they have shown like uh, we should ask for the patient to do the molecular testing. And this is the recommendation from the other side. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. And if any question, I would be happy to answer.